in the middle Yangtze River Valley constitute a major body of evidence for distinctive southern bronze industry in that region. To understand the special character of this bronze industry, we should go back in time and start with a brief review of the early Bronze Age in China. As we know, around the mid-second millennium BCE, a sophisticated bronze industry had been developed in the central plains in the middle Yellow River Valley, north of the Yangtze River, as indicated by the red oval on this topographic map of China. It marked the beginning of China's Bronze Age. And since then, this region continued to be the most important arena of bronze production and innovation throughout the Bronze Age. As we know, vessels were the hallmark of bronze cultures in central plains such as the tripod vessel called the Jia, seen on your right. And we can easily understand that by simply paying a short visit to our own Chinese bronze galleries. Most of the vessels, uh, most of the objects are vessels, except one, which is our beloved rhino in the sculpture form. But ultimately, it is a vessel as well, because the hollow belly serves as a functional vessel. This jar that you see on your right was found at the Zhengzhou, a name of a site, and actually also name of the city in today's Henan province in the very center of the Yellow River region. It was an early capital of the Song Dynasty. On the left, you see again the set of three Fanghe in the collection of the, of the Nezu Museum. Monumental square vessels. At the beginning of this lecture, you saw one of them in the Royal Academy exhibitions in London. This set of three was said to come from the tomb of a Song King, datable to the 12th century BCE at Anyang. Anyang is the name of a modern town in northeastern part of the Henan province, northeast of Zhengzhou, and in the end of the Song Dynasty, it served as the last capital of the Song Dynasty. Such vessels characterized the central plains tradition. As we know, central is a relative term versus peripheral. The central plains as a term is purely coined from the Chinese perspective. It's in the middle of the Chinese cultural sphere. And uh, it's a land, fertile, flat, conducive to great agricultural activities. That's why it is called a central plain. The bronze tradition in the central plain began to spread southward in the 14th century BCE. And then the first reached the Yangtze River region in its middle valley. The site that represents this southern expansion was called Panlongcheng in today's Hubei province. Again, Panlongcheng is a modern name of a site that we have the earliest indication of a southern expansion from the bronze culture of the central plain. As Panlongcheng, bronze stylistically homogeneous to those in the central plains were found in large quantity, such as the jia shown here on your left. It is very similar to the jia from Zhengzhou that we saw here on your right. This expansion, however, ended around the beginning of the 13th century BCE. In other words, lasted for about a century long. And in its wake, rose regional bronze traditions in various parts of China because expansion not only occurred southward, it's also radiated in other directions. And in the 13th century BCE, when 
the culture represented by the material evidence in Zhengzhou contracted and left behind in those regions the legacy what it brought to those regions, in this case, in the southern region. And the regional bronze industry was developed based on the legacy left by um, the Zhengzhou expansion. And that included several regions along the Yangtze River, such as Hunan in the Middle Valley. And if we trace along the Yangtze River upwards, ultimately we enter into Sichuan, into the Chen, Chengdu Plains, where the Sanxin Dui civilization flourished. And that was the subject of my specialty, if you will, that I had a the opportunity to speak to you in the past. So Hunan is situated south of the uh, south of the modern province of Hubei, on the other side of a lake called Dongting, so we call Dongting Lake. And you may notice the name of the modern province Hunan and the name of the modern province Hubei sound similar in the terms of first character, Hu, H-U, right? Because that is the character for lake, and it refers to Lake Dongting, which is a large body of water that we see here. And the character Nan, in the term of Hunan province, Hunan, Nan means south. And the character Bei, in the modern province name of Hubei, Bei means north. So in other words, those two modern provinces are named according to the, their relative position with the Lake Dongting. South of the Lake Hunan and north of the Lake Hubei. And the Lake Dongting is right along the Yangtze River Valley. So basically one province lies mostly south of the Yangtze River, the other mostly north of the Yangtze River. As we know, rivers or riverside paths were highways of human activities in antiquity. Ancient bronzes of Hunan have generally been found in those river valleys. The earliest bronzes so far known in Hunan, south of the Lake Dongting, are a few vessels datable to the 14th century BCE and very similar to their counterparts at the Pan Longcheng or further north in Central Plains, such as the Jia vessel seen here. We could not be sure, actually, if the Jia on your left, even though it was found in Hunan, was actually made in Hunan or was imported from north or elsewhere. The earliest Hunan bronze with a known archaeological origin appeared to be a gu. A gu is again a term, a conventional term describing this kind of uh, slender beaker, as we know. Gu vessel datable to the late 13th century BCE. This vessel seen on your left is comparable to the vessels of the same type from Anyang, the last capital of the Song Dynasty, seen on your right. It was excavated in the, a site called Tonggusan, the Hill of Bronze Drum, Tonggusan site in the Yueyang city, east of the Lake Dongting, Yueyang being yet another name of the modern city, a county seat. So it was excavated in a small hill in the administrative uh, uh, geography of the Yueyang city, and which lies east of the Lake Dongting, located by the southern bank of the Yangtze River. Here. And that is Yueyang. Tonggusan, as a site, is a small hill with a Song period settlement because archaeologists, uh, uh, archaeologists also discovered shards of pottery 
utensils and other evidence of a human inhabitation. So we call it settlement. Settlement site at a convenient cro crossroads for travels in all directions. As you can tell, this Yueyang's location is indeed good by the shore of the uh, Lake Dongting and connect directly through Lake Dongting to the Yangs River and also to the other river to the other parts of Hunan or trace further northward. So it is a crossroads. And the earliest pottery shards found there are similar to those of the Panlongcheng site in Hubei, north of uh, Lake Dongting province, which suggests their site along the Lake Dongting at Yueyang may have been one of the routes by which some material culture penetrated southward across the Yangtze River. And that is extremely important because Yangtze River is a big river. As much as a conduit of traffic, it is also a barrier. So for the long period of time, the some material culture penetrated up to the north shore of the Yangtze River. But Yueyang here represents the earliest evidence of some material culture across the river of Yangtze to the southern part of the Yangtze River, particularly along the Lake Dongting area. So that is why it is extremely important. Besides the Tonggu San Gu, only a few other vessels, all of which were found in northern Hunan, can be dated to the 13th century BCE. This dearth contrasts greatly with the abundance of bronzes dating from the 12th or 11th centuries BCE when the local regional bronze industry flourished. Around 400 vessels have been found across Hunan dating from the 12th and 11th centuries BCE, mostly along the four major rivers crisscrossing that province, particularly the Xiang River, as indicated by this arrow. And there are the other three rivers from the east to the west. You see this one, that one, and that one. Stylistically speaking, the Ku and the Jia shown here are devoid of local characteristics. They serve to exemplify the stylistic conventions developed in the middle Yellow River Valley in the central plains in the north. They feature a well-articulated and restrained shape composed of distinct parts that impart an architectonic quality. They look like a well-articulated uh, uh, totality that looks some of the time like a building. And the decorative motifs nearly a neatly arranged in horizontal registers that are often further divided into three or four com compartments. For example, here you could see two registers, right? The register of Tao Tia and the register of a uh, horror pattern. And in this case, the Tao, there are three components, compartments, each housing one Tao Tia. And here you can see a major com uh, register of uh, Tao Tia only suggested by the eyeballs, and then another register of Tao Tia, and they also have uh, three compartments, each containing one, and in between on top, or in between the bowstring design, which means thread lines in relief. So the registration, I mean the register arrangement is very neat. This is again another architectural quality that we can relate to. By contrast, a richly furnished tomb at Xingan, yet another place name, Xingan, in the neighboring Jiangxi province. Jiangxi is the name of the province east of the Hunan province. In that province, there's a small site, also by a river. The site is called Xingan, and uh, represents an earlier development of a regional bronze culture in the 13th century BCE. The large number of bronzes buried in the Xingan tomb include examples comparable to an unprovenanced thing in the Hunan Provincial Museum. This and other evidence suggest that
that Shingan may have played a significant role in the development of a bronze industry in Hunan, though not necessarily in the development of all of its cultural characteristics. As we know, Shingan and Lake Dongting are in two different provinces, which are next to each other. But when we're talking about geography, we're using modern terms. In the ancient cultural sphere, there's no relevance what the modern political boundary is about. So Shingan in Jiangxi and Dongting, Lake Dongting in Hunan, culturally are same continuum. They also both have evidence of a development of a local regional bronze industry. Shingan had an earlier uh, um, evidence because we can tell from the comparison here with these two large ding. Both show some emerging characteristics of the Yangtze River Valley bronzes. It has a pair of a rather oversized handles here. A deep bow, very deep, three columnar legs, tautian motif in thread relief, and hooked flanges. This hooked flanges was very indicative of a local characteristics. All those features found their origin in the Central Plains bronze industry. Individually, you can find them in the Northern Convention. But just such a combination has not been encountered there. It was a southern combination. It was the beginning of a regional southern bronze culture. And it's a hooked flanges foretells a trait prominent in the Yangtze River region in the 12th and 11th centuries BCE to come. By the beginning of the 12th centuries BCE, a vibrant bronze using culture had firmly developed in the Hunan province. Let me just use the modern term because it's anachronistic. At that time, there was no Hunan province, but we understand. And uh, that industry would prosper for the ensuing 200 years, as demonstrated by the large number of bronzes unearthed there, making Hunan the most abundant region along the Yangtze River. As mentioned earlier, around 400 bronze, bronzes have been found across Hunan. Present archaeological data seems to suggest that the phenomenon of extensive use of bronzes emerged rather suddenly. The mechanism by which this bronze using tradition was adopted and came to evolve is little understood. But it is likely to have evolved the immigration of the social elite and the bronze experts from outside, as well as participation of the local elite. As the bronzes display both similarities with the contemporaneous bronzes elsewhere and the features special to Hunan, including also, when I say here, to Hunan region, it also including southern Hubei as part of the same cultural sphere. Bronzes of the 12th and 11th centuries from Hunan can be readily divided into three stylistic categories. Central plains style, local style, and the mixed style that combines the two. The vessel of the type called the Yo, seen on your left, is an excellent example of the central plains style. It finds a close comparison at the sun capital of Anyang, as seen on your right, both almost identical except the color of patination, which in this particular case, this kind of, actually the slice is not very good. It's more emerald green, dark emerald green color, very particular to Hunan, had a lot to do with the soil condition of the burial. And in Chinese, sometimes they call it the water green color. It's a very peculiar to the Hunan bronzes. Such vessels were either brought from central plains or cast locally in Hunan by immigrants, uh, bronze caster, 
from the north. The local style is best represented by the type of bell, conventionally called nao. Unfortunately, in our museum, we don't have a good example of a large nao. Their size tend to be fairly big, and as big, as heavy as they can weigh for 200 pounds. And the bold decoration are very striking. The primary design on the example seen here is typical, featuring a bold, ropey motif, loosely based on the Tauti motif seen on the vessels and centered on a pair of eyes. So basically, you are seeing here a pair of eyes, which indicates a face. Then you start reading into it. This may be the nose. This may be the double jaw, like Tauti, and this may be the eyes and the horns. So, but they are very abstract. Without an understanding of Tauti, that we will not be able to relate uh, 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 these. But the pair of eyes give us a way and give us a clue to reconstruct the origin of this motif that may have derived from the Tauti. This particular bell also carries images of two tigers, one on each corner. And uh, this, even though it's not very realistic, we can tell it's a tiger mostly by stripes, also by the particular curly tail on uh, either side. And here you see another Tautian motif, much more abbreviated, again a pair of eyes, the nose, the double jaw, and uh, the body, extend horizontally directly from the eyes, turning upward and downward, and these are the two ears. So you see different versions of Tao Te play there, but you cannot find any similar Tao Te on central plains bronze vessels. The rendition of Tao Te here is entirely unique to Hunan. This is the kind of the set of bell just as a short detour always mounted with stem down and the mouth up. And its cross section is like an almond, it's an oval, which means if you strike at different places uh, along the mouth rim, it will create different vibration which responds for different tongues. This is the ancestor of bell charms that we will encounter later in the Chinese Bronze Age. And uh, typically, you will strike one in the middle or one of the each corner to obtain the two-tone. So this two-tone phenomenon started with the now of this kind. But we did not discover that this two-tone phenomenon until the 1980s. And one of the scholars who first wrote about it or discovered was the former director of the Shanghai Museum, Mr. Ma, for whom I was his secretary for about five years. And uh, uh, the difference between the bell charm later is that one would turn it upside down, stem up, mouth down, and also mount in such a way that it tilted towards you so it's easier to facilitate your striking with one face tilted towards the musician who has a mallet. This one would be mounted vertically. So we know it physically has a capability of a two-tone phenomenon. We did not know for sure it was used for that purpose. Because the, so far, the largest assembly that we got is five and nine, and the nine were the more recent ones. Mostly these bronze now bells were found individually. We clearly understood they could be used as a noise maker. Noise maker like big gong to give signals. They may or may not be used as the music instruments which is defined by the capability of producing, a, making a score, right, to play out a music. But towards the end of it, oh, indeed, we found a set of five and the more recently found a set of nine. And so the bell charm may indeed have started with no bell towards the very end of its evolution. But that is a different subject not directly related to what we are talking here. So as I mentioned, in actual use,
the large bell would be mounted with the stem down and the curved mouth up. And each bell capable of producing two distinct tones, one by striking the center of the mouth rim, the other by striking either corner. This capability is made possible by the almond-shaped cross-section of the bell, which causes the bell to emit different vibration patterns when struck at different points. More than 40 now bells have been unearthed in Hunan, about 10 or so weighing more than 100 kilos, kilograms. Two large bells are little, such large bells are little known anywhere else. They are largely confined to Hunan. More than any other artifact type, the large now bell, now again is a conventional term calling this type of bell. Large now bell manifests an independent bronze industry in Hunan in the middle Yangtze River Valley. But unlike the Song civilization in the north, this region, as well as other regions of China, they did not have evidence, we don't have evidence of writing. Most likely they did not have writing system, or unlikely, the two more smaller possibility, they only wrote on perishable material, that we don't see them. But suffice to say, most likely they don't have writing, so we don't know how those objects uh, would be called, and uh, for what purpose they use, there are no documents whatsoever. This is another type of bell called a bore, being again a conventional term called this type of uh, bell. This bore is equally unique to the middle Yangtze River Valley, but represented in far fewer numbers than now bells. Their morphological features include a flattened shape of elliptical cross-section, two flanges along the side edges, and a loop for suspension. Each face of the ball seen here is decorated with a peculiar Tautian motif with large eyes. You can see here. Eyes, flange at the nose, double jaw, and the body and the ears. So, but quite different from what we have seen on the previous now bell. <clears throat> on the right and the left edges of the bell face are two flanges, each consisting of two descending tiger. In addition, the Tauti motif is bisected by a short openwork flange topped with a small bird as you can see from the side view. As we know, bird is an extremely important motif, particularly in the middle of Yangtze River Valley. The flanges on the ball bells draw our attention to a fascination with the motifs drawn from real animals, especially birds, on Hunan bronzes. Although birds are often seen on bronzes of the central plains style, as we see on this Yo vessel, it is unknown among those essential plants, bronzes, that a flange could be formed of birds, but they do in Hunan, such as seen in the Yo on your right. For example, the whole flanges is little birds, three, one on top of another. Another powerful example illustrating the importance of bird is a vessel lid on which stands a proportionally overwhelming, overpowering bird with a high crest and a trailing tail. In the, today's uh, Musée Guimet in Paris, it also allegedly came from Hunan, in, from the city of Changsa, where the art dealers would have congregated. In the central plain, birds sometimes serve as a handle on the lid as well, but never with such drama and the, prom and the prominence. The prominence did not always require large size, however. In the case of the wider ball, we see again, a small bird clearly takes on a larger than life significance and quality because of its essential placement on the beast. Literally, it takes a ride on the white ball. Besides birds, 
Numerous other animal motifs were included in the iconography of Hunan bronzes, such as tiger, fish, snake, horse, etc., and of course, ram. The fascination with the real creatures was more dramatically manifested in the form of three-dimensional animal shapes, whose lifelikeness and the animated spirit were unparalleled anywhere else in China. Examples include the wild boar and the elephant we see here, also excavated in Hunan with clear provenance. The elephant carries elaborate surface decoration of various animal designs, including Tautian motif, tigers, dragons, snakes, and the birds. Some motifs, such as the dragon, do bespeak of the central plan's connection and style. But the lively animal shape demonstrates unquestionably a taste peculiar to the Hunan region. This dedicated interest in making vessels in the naturalistic shape of actual animals contrasts sharply with its absence in the north in the central plain. Let's contrast the elephant with a quadruped from Anyang, the last capital of Song Dynasty in the north. The quadruped on your left came from the tomb of Fu Hao, Lady Fu Hao at Anyang. It, it is cast with an inscription carrying the posthumous name for Lady Fu Hao, who was a queen of the Song King. It was still today the largest, the richest intact tomb found at Anyang. The vessel typifies the convention in rendering animal shapes in the north in the central plain. They tend to be stiff, ungainly creatures rather removed from real life. In this case, it is hard to tell what, a, what a animal it represents. That's why I called quadruped. It. it has four legs, that's all I know. Actually, it is a composite. It is a composite. It's a hind legs face backward and belongs to a creature, to be precise, creature that is a bird whose large wing is visible in the slide, as you can tell here. By contrast, the elephant from Hunan is much more naturalistic. This kind of lively rendering defines a southern bronze tradition. And to make another smaller point, as you can tell, this composite, the two front legs actually facing forward. If you look carefully at this bird, the legs facing backwards. So I don't know how this animal could possibly move because uh, the, uh, this uh, 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 creatures in the front and the bird probably they are intended on going separate directions. Both the elephant and the boar exemplifies the mixed style which marries a local convention in rendering animal shapes with decorative motifs featured influenced by the central plan as seen on those two vessels surface design. Another extraordinary case is the rectangular ding decorated with human faces in place of Tao Te motif. Here, it is a decoration that expresses the local feature while the shape of the vessel conforms closely to the central plans convention. The slide on your right shows an example from Anyang as well. And, uh, but this human face does not necessarily belong to a human. If you look carefully, you can see the ears on both sides and the horns on top of the ears. More importantly, you see the claw, the feet. He has or she has feet that has claws. So actually, if we remember, some of you may remember uh, this famous vessel in the Freer Gallery. It's a rounded vessel. The lid is in the shape of a human face. And behind it, you see a serpentine body winding around the surface of the vessel. So it's a, 
and also has claw feet. So it's most likely a conventionally understood dragon with a human face of it. The most dramatic examples of this mixed styles are the two Yo vessels in the form of a tiger in a fully sculptural form. The tiger squats on its hind legs and tail and holds a human with its open paw beneath its gaping mouth, perhaps to devour the figure or perhaps to protect him. Actually, uh, in Chinese terms, it's always called that Yo in the shape of a tiger devouring a human. And I'm really not sure, because I think this human looks remarkably peaceful, remarkably content in the situation, and it could be being protected. And if we, again, if we're looking at the Buddhist and the Hindu religions, you see the Buddha or the Hindu god protected by snakes as a hood. So the animal holding some human creature in the mouth could be a gesture of protection rather than it devouring, or could be both. The, the naturalistic quality of the shape is unquestionably southern. While a surface design includes motifs originated in the central plains, such as the dragons, both vessels are said to come from Hunan again. The one on your left is now in the Sumitomo collection in the Senoku Hakokan in Kyoto. And the one on your right at the Muzi Chenuski in Paris. So by this time, you can now tell the French and the Japanese really have a good taste for Chinese bronzes. They like those very sculptural forms. They are nearly identical and may be considered as a pair. They are different from our rhinos, uh, uh, from uh, our rams, because our rams are very close, but they are not as identical as the pair of tiger holding a human in the mouth. So our rams may not be called as a pair. And this brings us finally back to the two double ram chun. Certainly, the double ram chun in both the British Museum collection and the Nezu collection belong to the mixed style as well. We can firmly place them in the context of Hunan archaeological finds, along with all the other objects in private and the museum collections. Different from the pair of tiger-shaped vessels, we may not call the double ram zun as a pair, because there is significant difference in the style of surface decoration. But unquestionably, they were closely related, originating from the same artistic design, and perhaps developed in the same workshop, same foundry. Those two double ram chun have enabled us to enter into a rich world of southern bronze industry in the middle Yangtze River region. They testify to brilliant artistic innovation dynamic cultural interaction, and a powerful regional elite capable of sustaining a strong bronze tradition and industry and its own cultural identity. Thank you very much.